Hello, and welcome to Historical Humans Reads, where we take primary sources and bring them to your screen. I'm Cullen Coleman, and today we are reading From the Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton. Written in 1920, The Age of Innocence was originally published in four parts in the magazine Pictorial Review before its release as a full novel. Divided internally into two books that same year, in 1921, it was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. The Age of Innocence is a true period piece, exploring the self-imposed struggles and antics of American high society during the Gilded Age in New York City, where embarrassment is treated like a disease and conformity is made paramount. Today, we'll be reading Chapter 2 of Book 1 of The Age of Innocence. With that, Let's begin. Newland Archer, during this brief episode, had been thrown into a strange state of embarrassment. It was annoying that the box which was thus attracting the undivided attention of masculine New York should be that in which his betrothed was seated between her mother and her aunt. And, for a moment, he could not identify the lady in the empire dress, nor imagine why her presence created such excitement among the initiated. Then light dawned on him, and with it came a momentary rush of indignation. No, indeed. No one would have thought the Mingots would have tried it on. But they had. They undoubtedly had, for... The low-toned comments behind him left no doubt in Archer's mind that the young woman was May Wellen's cousin, the cousin always referred to in the family as poor Ellen Olenska. Archer knew that she had suddenly arrived from Europe a day or two previously. He had even heard from Miss Welland, not disapprovingly, that she had been to see her poor Ellen, who was staying with old Mrs. Mingott. Archer entirely approved of family solidarity, and one of the qualities he most admired in the Mingots was their resolute championship of the few black sheep that their blameless stock had produced. There was nothing mean or ungenerous in the young man's heart, and he was glad that his future wife should not be restrained by false prudery from being kind in private to her unhappy cousin. But to receive Countess Olenska in the family circle was a different thing from producing her in public, at the opera of all places, and in the very box with the young girl whose engagement to him, Newland Archer, was to be announced within a few weeks. No, he felt as old Sillerton Jackson felt. He did not think the Mingots would have tried it on. He, of course, knew that... Whatever man dared within Fifth Avenue's limits, that old Miss Mance's Mingot, the matriarch of the line, would dare. He had always admired the high and mighty old lady, who, in spite of having been only Catherine Spicer of Staten Island, with a father mysteriously discredited, and neither money nor position enough to make people forget it, had allied herself with the head of the wealthy Mingot line, married two of her daughters to foreigners, an Italian marquis and an English banker, and put the crowning touch to her audacities by building a larger house of pale cream-colored stone when brown sandstone seemed as much the only wear as a frock coat in the afternoon in an inaccessible wilderness near Central Park. Old Mrs. Mingott's foreign daughters had become a legend. They never came back to see their mother, and the latter being, like many persons of active mind and dominating will, sedentary and corpulent in her habit, had philosophically remained at home. But the cream-colored house, supposed to be modeled on the private houses of Parisian aristocracy, was there as visible proof of her moral courage, and she throned it in among pre-revolutionary furniture and souvenirs of the Tuileries of Louis-Napoleon, where she had shown in her middle age, as placidly as if there were nothing peculiar in living above 34th Street or in having French windows that opened like doors instead of sashes that pushed up. 
everyone, including Mr. Sillerton Jackson, was agreed that old Catherine had never been a beauty, a gift which, in the eyes of New York, justified every success and excused a certain number of failings. Unkind people said that, like her imperial namesake, she had won her way to success by strength of will and hardness of heart, and had a kind of haughty effrontery that was somehow justified by the extreme decency and dignity of her private life. Mr. Manson Mingott had died when she was only 28, and had tied up the money with an additional caution born of the general distrust of the Spicers. But his bold young winner went her way furiously, mingled freely in foreign society, married her daughters in heaven knew what corrupt and fashionable circles, hobnobbed with the dukes and ambassadors, associated familiarly with the papists, entertained opera singers, and was an intimate friend of M. E. Taglione. And all the while, as Sillerton Jackson was the first to proclaim, there had never been a breath on her reputation. The only respect, he always added, in which she differed from the earlier Catherine. Mrs. Manson Mingott had long since succeeded in untying her husband's fortune and had lived in affluence for half a century. But memories of her early straits had made her excessively thrifty, and though when she bought a dress or a piece of furniture, she took care that it should be of the best, she could not bring herself to spend much on transient pleasures of the table. Therefore, for totally different reasons, her food was as poor as Mr. Archer's, and her wines did nothing to redeem it. Relatives considered that the penury of her table discredited the Mingut name, which had always been associated with good living. But people continued to come to her in spite of the made dishes and flat champagne, and in reply to the remonstrances of her son Lavelle, who tried to retrieve the family credit by having the best chef in New York, she used to say laughingly, What's the use of two good cooks in one family, now that I've married the girls and can't eat sauces? Newland Archer, as he mused on these things, had once more turned his eyes towards the Mingut box. He saw that Mrs. Welland and her sister-in-law were facing their semicircle of critics with the Mingotian aplomb which old Catherine had included in all her tribe, and that only Mary Welland betrayed by a heightened color, perhaps due to the knowledge that he was watching her, a sense of the gravity of the situation. As for the cause of the commotion, she sat gracefully in her corner of the box, eyes fixed on the stage, revealing, as she leaned forward, a little more shoulder and bosom than New York was accustomed to seeing, at least in ladies who had reasons for wishing to pass unnoticed. Few things seemed to Newland Archer more awful than an offense against taste, that far-off divinity whose form was the mere visible representative and vice-generate. Madame Olenska's pale and serious face appealed to his fancy as suited to the occasion and to her unhappy situation, but the way her dress, which had no tucker, sloped away from her thin shoulders, shocked and troubled him. He hated to think of May Wellens being exposed to the influence of a young woman so careless to the dictates of taste. After all, he heard one of the young men begin behind him. Everybody talked through the Mesophysles and Martha scene. After all, just what happened? Well, she left him. Nobody attempts to deny that. He's an awful brute, isn't he? Continued the young inquirer, a candid Thorley, who was evidently preparing to enter the lists as the ladies' champion. The very worst. I knew him at Nice, said Lawrence Lefferts with an authority, a half-paralyzed, white sneering fellow, rather handsome head, but eyes with a lot of lashes. Well, I'll tell you the sort. When he wasn't with women, he was collecting China. Paying any price for both, I understand. There was a general laugh, and the young champion said, Well, then. Well, then she bolted with his secretary. Ah, I see. The champion's face fell. It didn't last long, though. I heard 
of her a few months later living alone in Venice. I believe Lovell Mingott went out to get her. He said she was desperately unhappy. That's all right, but this parading her at the opera is another thing. Perhaps, young Thorley hazardous, she's too unhappy to be left at home. This was greeted with an irreverent laugh, and the youth blushed deeply and tried to look as if he had meant to insinuate what knowing people called a double entree. Well, it's queer to have brought Miss Wellen, anyhow, someone said in a low tone with a side glance at Archer. Oh, that's part of the campaign. Granny's orders, no doubt, Lefebvre's laughed. When the old lady does a thing, she does it thoroughly. <laughs> the act was ending, and there was a general stir in the box. Suddenly, Newland Archer felt himself impelled to a decisive action. The desire to be the first man to enter Miss Mingott's box, to proclaim to the waiting world his engagement to May Welland, and to see her through whatever difficulties her cousin's anomalous situation might involve her in. This impulse had abruptly overruled all scruples and hesitations, and sent him hurrying through the red quarters to the farther side of the house. As he entered the box, his eyes met Miss Wellens, and he saw that she had instantly understood his motive. Through the family dignity, which both considered so high a virtue, would not permit her to tell him so. The persons of their world lived in an atmosphere of faint implications and pale delicacies, and the fact that he and she understood each other without a word seemed to the young man to bring them nearer than any explanation would have done. His eyes said, You see why Mama, or her eyes said, You see why Mama brought me, and his answered, I would not for the world have asked you to stay away. You know my niece, Countess Oleska? Mrs. Welland inquired as she shook hands with her future son in law. Archer bowed without extending his hand, as was the custom on being introduced to a lady and Len Oleska bent her head slightly, keeping her own pale glove hands clasped on her huge fan of eagle feathers. Having greeted Mrs. Lovell Mingott, a large blonde lady in creaking satin, he sat down beside his betrothed and said in a low tone, I hope you've told Madame Olenska that we're engaged. I want everybody to know. I want you to let me announce it this evening at the ball. Miss Wellens' face grew rosy as the dawn, and she looked at him with radiant eyes. If you can persuade Mama, she said, but why should we change what is already settled? He made no answer, but that which in his eyes returned, and she added, still more confidently smiling, tell my cousin yourself, I give you leave. She says she used to play with you when you were children. She made way for him by pushing back her chair, and promptly, and a little instantly, with the desire that the whole house should see what he was doing, Archer seated himself at the Countess Olenska's side. We did used to play together, didn't we? She asked, turning her grave eyes to his. You were a horrid boy and kissed me once behind a door, but it was your cousin Vandy Newland, who never looked at me, that I was in love with. Her glance slept through the horseshoe curve of the boxes. Ah, how this all brings it back to me. I see everybody here, in knickerbockers and pantalettes, she said, her right with her trailing slightly foreign accent, her eyes returning to his face. Agreeable as her, their expression was, the young man was shocked that they should reflect so unseemly a picture of, of the august tribunal before which, at the very moment, her case was being tried. Nothing could be in worse taste than misplaced flippancy, and he answered somewhat stiffly, Yes, you have been away a very long time. Oh, centuries and centuries so long, she said, that I'm sure I'm dead and buried, and this dear old place is heaven, which, for reasons he could not define, struck Newland Archer as an even more disrespectful way of describing New York society. This has been an excerpt from The Age of Innocence on Historical Humans Reads. If you enjoyed the video and like to hear more excerpts from original texts, Please subscribe to be notified of the next one. If there is a work you would like to hear, please be sure to like the video and leave a comment listing it below. Thank you for listening.